For a long time, I thought of physics as providing evened out solutions and approximations to the messiness of nature. That is, the parabolic arc of a baseball under freefall, or the wonderfully smooth, complex solutions while solving electrostatics or heat diffusion problems simply provided an idealized guess at reality. These approaches could give me round curves and continuous functions, but the jagged edges and bumps found in nature were not easily reproducible with simple equations. Then I met fluid mechanics, a beast so large and painstaking to attack that I have no doubt I will never get through all of it. However, even some of its simplest approximations give profound results, and an equation with just speed, position, and time spits out corners that I wanted. My goal in this video will be to give an introduction to these corners, what a scientist or mathematician might call shock waves, and show how the simple equation that effectively governs so many diffuse phenomena gives rise to the complexity we see all around us. Okay, so that was just a lot of big words, but long story short, this video will cover some basics of nonlinear partial differential equations and hopefully show y'all how straightforward equations can have very intricate behavior. I'm going to try to avoid as many math prerequisites as I can for this video, but a solid understanding of a derivative is strongly recommended and a good grasp of the chain rule wouldn't hurt either. All right, so with the introduction out of the way, let's jump in. Newton's second law of motion is one of the most famous equations ever. It tells us that the force on a particle is equal to the rate of change of its momentum, or if its mass doesn't change, F equals MA. At its heart, this is a differential equation. That is, acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, dv dt, and velocity is the rate of change of position, dx dt. So acceleration is the rate of change of the rate of change of position, d squared x dt squared. So if we know the force as a function of position, say in the case of a mass on a spring, or a planet orbiting a star, then we have positions on both sides and we can solve for the particle's position as a function of time. Describing a fluid is similar. However, unlike a particle, a fluid is a continuum. Think about a wave coming into a beach. Every distance away from the shore, the water moves at a different speed. And as time passes on, the speed at a given distance changes too. Therefore, to describe a fluid's speed, you need both a position and a time. So the velocity of that ocean wave crashing on the shore is a function of the distance from the shore and the time since it formed. That means that if we want to think about a water wave, or any fluid for that matter, our best bet is to try to give the velocity for every point in space and at every moment in time. That means that our velocity is just a function. You give me a point in space and a moment in time, and our function tells you the speed and direction that fluid is moving. Another good way to think about how we describe fluids mathematically is by visualizing a vector field. At every point in space, we draw an arrow, representing the velocity of the fluid there. And as time moves forward and the velocity changes, so too do the arrows. This is a very powerful technique that expands well beyond the field of fluids, from Newtonian gravity to analyzing migrations of animals. Thinking in terms of vector fields is how I conceptualize most fluid problems, but for our instance in this video, as we'll see shortly, there might be a better way to see what's going on. In the simplified case of a fluid that only moves in one direction, say gas moving through a pipe, the position only needs one number. The number tells you how far along the pipe is to look. Similarly, the velocity is also just a number. It tells you how fast the fluid is moving at some position in time. Finally, the time is just a number that tells you how far in the future or the past to look since you started your clock. This is the case we'll focus on. Two independent variables, position and time, and one dependent variable, the speed of the fluid at those points. This is undoubtedly a simplified model going from three spatial dimensions down to one but this large reduction in parameters will allow us to focus in on the core mathematical principles at play. So what does this velocity function look like then? Are there rules we can place on it to determine how it must evolve in time if we give those rules some initial profile? Well, luckily there is, and all we have to do is look back to our old friend Newton. Newton tells us that F equals MA. This is as long as the mass of whatever we're considering does not change, and if we assume the fluid we are studying has constant density, a good approximation for any fluid moving relatively slowly, then we can assume that it does. So F equals MA, but what does that mean for a fluid? To apply Sir Newton to the idea of a fluid, we need to zoom in. Zoom into the size of a small box. This box moves with the fluid. 
And if we can ascribe what happens to this tiny box in a tiny time, we'll have its acceleration. In fact, we can ascribe this motion on the position time plane. Initially, the box starts at some point, and because the fluid has a velocity, it moves through both space and time. This line that our box traces is the position along the pipe of our box as time passes. And if we zoom in, we'll find something very interesting. At this point, let's call it x1, t1. The box is moving with some velocity, we'll similarly name v1. Likewise, we'll name this pair of points x2, t2, and the box's velocity at this point, v2. Now, the key question to ask is how does this velocity change along this path that the box follows? We want to see dv dt evaluated along the path. The way we'll do this is by first traveling to a point x1, t2 along a path that keeps x constant and see how velocity changes. Then by traveling from that point to the final point x2, t2 along a path keeping t constant, we can see how the total velocity changes. A key realization here is that by adding the velocity changes together along these two different paths, we have found the total change in velocity along their hypotenuse. For those of you familiar with Calc 3, this is exactly the multivariable chain rule, and this sort of visualization is what finally made it click for me. Okay, so what is the change in velocity from x1, t1 to x1, t2? Well, because x is constant, we only need to worry about how v changes with t. We'll write that along this first path, delta v equals delta v over delta t times delta t. All this equation says is that fractions work. Dividing and multiplying by the same delta t changes nothing. However, delta v delta t, if we keep x constant, is just the change in velocity at the point in space. This is the definition of a partial derivative. If we take the limit as delta t goes to zero, math major shenanigans, blah, blah, blah. This is the change in velocity if we look at the same position in the pipe as time moves forward. The important thing is that we have just found the change in v along path A in terms of a partial derivative and delta t. Namely, dv dt along path A equals partial v partial t times delta t. Okay, so what is then dv dt along path B? Well, we'll write it similarly by saying delta v divided by delta x times delta x, or partial v partial x times delta x. This is the change in velocity of the fluid as we move along the pipe, how the velocity changes with position. But now we're left with this weird delta x. Can we express it in terms of delta t? Well, luckily we can. Because we're only concerned about one line in our plane, namely the line that our tiny box of fluid follows, we can parameterize delta x in terms of another variable, delta t. This reparameterization is a bit tricky, so let's make sure we see what's going on. Okay, so we know that the fluid box travels along some line in the xt plane. And to define every point on a line, you only need one variable. For example, the arc length variable, s, which tells you how much distance along that line you have traveled from a chosen starting point. However, in our case, we're going to choose to parameterize our line with a variable we already have, t. Essentially, all this means is that you give me a time, and I give you a coordinate in the xt plane. If we look at the collection of these points over all time, we get our parameterized line. Okay, great. So how does this delta x we were considering relate to our parameterized variable t? Well, we can write out some algebra again, and we get delta x equals delta x divided by delta t times delta t, with the delta x over delta t evaluated along our parameterized line. But delta x over delta t along this line is just the velocity along the line, or v. So delta x equals v times delta t. And therefore, delta v divided by delta x times delta x equals partial v partial x times v delta t. Now we have it. We have a small change in our velocity along our line. The total change in velocity, delta v, following our tiny fluid box is simply delta v equals v times partial v partial x times delta t plus partial v partial t times delta t. This gives us delta v in terms of only one variable, delta t. So dividing by delta t gives us a full derivative, 
And again, ignoring the math majors yields dv dt equals v times partial v partial x plus partial v partial t. This is amazing. Our equation gives a full derivative of velocity in terms of only partial derivatives and velocity itself. But we know what a full derivative of velocity with respect to time is. It's acceleration. So our equation reads a equals v partial v partial x plus partial v partial t. For those of you comfortable with the multivariable chain rule, we can get this result in a few quick lines by writing a equals dv dt equals dv of x of t comma t dt equals partial v partial x times dx dt plus partial v partial t times dt dt, which of course is equal to our original result v partial v partial x plus partial v partial t. This equation tells us that there are two components to a fluid's acceleration. One is the change in velocity over time at a singular point in space. This is given by partial v partial t. To imagine this term, I think of some fluid moving with uniform velocity that simultaneously increases its speed. Of course the fluid box is accelerating, all of them are. The second term is a bit more tricky at first glance and is commonly called the advective term. v times partial v partial x. For this one, I like to think of a fluid and a pipe with a narrowing cross section. As the radius decreases, the fluid must speed up to squeeze through the smaller opening. And how much does it speed up by? Well, it's v times partial v partial x. And to get the total acceleration, we just add them together. A fact made true by the fact that space and time are somewhat perpendicular. So that our acceleration is v times partial v partial x plus partial v partial t. This was the hard part of Newton, because now we have the acceleration of a fluid, we can put it into his equation. So F equals ma. And what is our mass for the tiny box? Well, it's density, rho, times the volume, v. F equals rho v times v, partial v partial x, plus partial v partial t. Good, we're almost there. It turns out that the force on an inviscid fluid is the gradient of the pressure, del p times the volume, plus mass times body accelerations which usually means gravity and is zero in the horizontal x direction. So F equals volume times partial P partial X, which is equal to rho V times V partial V partial X plus partial V partial T. Dividing by mass gives us the one dimensional inviscid Navier-Stokes equation. One over rho times partial P partial X is equal to V times partial V partial X plus partial V partial T. This equation is crazy. It tells us so much about the motion of fluids in one line, anything that flows. And it's why Navier-Stokes is such a big deal. On the left side, we have our force term, and the right side, our acceleration. Solving this equation is not easy, but what if we made it simpler? What if we asked what happens to our idealized one-dimensional fluid if no forces were acting on it? Well, F equals ma, and if F equals zero, then acceleration is two. In other words, A equals zero, so v partial v partial x plus partial v partial t equals zero. All this differential equation is saying is that each element of our fluid feels no forces and therefore is not accelerating. Of course, this is a fairly large approximation, but it is an approximation so useful that it has its own name, the inviscid Burgers equation. Yes, Burgers like McDonald's Burgers, but Johannes Martinus Burgers was a Dutch physicist, not an American business mogul. Burgers wanted to understand turbulence in fluids, and along the way, stumbled onto this equation. So, let's try to solve it, keeping in mind that all it considers is a one-dimensional fluid whose individual elements do not accelerate, and see where it takes us. V partial V partial X plus partial V partial T equals zero. What are we really looking at here? Well, it's a differential equation. It's got derivatives in it. And because these derivatives are partial derivatives, not full derivatives, it's also a partial differential equation. Furthermore, the v partial v partial x has a factor of v in it twice. This makes it a nonlinear partial differential equation. This nonlinearity is actually the root of the odd behavior we'll see, so that's why we spent so much time seeing where the nonlinearity came from through our thorough investigation of the chain rule. All right, so it's a nonlinear partial differential equation we got. And now we gotta ask ourselves, how do we even solve something like this? What exactly are we looking for? Well, I think it's nice to go back to the mindset of an engineer in this context. We know x, 
it's just some position along our pipe. And we know T, it similarly is the time on our watch. So what we really want to solve for then is velocity, V, at some given position in time. In other words, we want to find V of X comma T. The problem is, there are an infinite number of solutions I could give you of the form V of X comma T that satisfy this equation. So we'll need to add some extra constraints. What if, as an engineer, we could measure at some given time T equals zero, all of the velocities along the pipe. That is, we have what you might call a velocity profile at an initial time, and we want to predict what happens to that velocity as time moves forward. This is called an initial condition, and it is the information we need to completely solve this equation. In general, differential equations need some type of initial condition, or boundary conditions if you like partial differential equations, and in our instance, we need some velocity profile. All right, we're finally here. Time to solve the inviscid Burgers equation. We have v partial v partial x plus partial v partial t equals zero, and some function v of x comma zero as initial conditions. At this point, it might be helpful to take a step back and try to visualize the problem. So since velocity is a function of two variables, x and t, and our velocity is just a number, we can visualize our velocity as the z-axis on a 3D graph, with position and time forming the base plane. Then, for every pair of points, x comma t, the velocity at that position in time is just given by the height of the graph. Our initial conditions, we said, was a velocity given for every position at t equals zero. So that's just a line running through the t equals zero plane. Then, what our differential equation tells us is how to evolve that line through time. Imagine grabbing the line and spreading it out over time so that it covers not just a 2D line, but a whole sheet. That sheet is our solution, and our differential equation will tell us exactly how that sheet looks. So to actually solve Berger's equation, to find that 2D sheet, we're going to first look at our initial condition, the velocity profile. This velocity profile tells us at every x what our velocity is at t equals zero. So every little box of fluid is moving with speed v at point x when t is nil. But here's the critical insight to solving this equation. Instead of looking at all the boxes from one rest frame, let's imagine we're on a cart, moving at the same speed as the fluid right next to us initially is. Just like Einstein imagined chasing a beam of light, we will imagine riding along with our tiny box of water. So what does that mean? Well, initially to us, it doesn't look like it's moving. That is, we are moving along at the same speed as our tiny box, so to us, it looks like it's at rest, like two cars on the highway going 75 look stationary to each other. So when we move with our box at t equals zero, it doesn't appear to be moving. But since acceleration, dv dt, equals zero, that means the velocity of our little boxes never change. From their initial velocities, our boxes propagate at that same speed, moving along the x-coordinate as they do. This insight is very important and it is what allows us to solve this equation. Each tiny box of fluid does not accelerate, so each tiny box moves at the same speed as it did at t equals zero. Finding paths along which the change in some variable is easier to find and work with, full derivative, is called the method of characteristics, and it is what we just used when we imagined gliding along with our water box. It can be applied to whole classes of nonlinear partial differential equations, and this sort of analysis might be encountered in a college course on the subject. Okay, so the boxes don't accelerate. What does that mean for us solving it? Well, to start, let's see how that would play out in an example. Imagine we had a profile that looks like this. Flat, then up, and then flat again. All the boxes before x equals minus one move at two meters per second. In between, we have this intermediary line. And at x equals one, the boxes of fluid move at four meters per second. To illustrate this, let's draw our xt plane and see what our solutions look like there. At t equals zero and x is less than negative one, our fluid moves in lines with a slope equal to 0.5 seconds per meter, or inverting that, two meters per second. And because the boxes do not accelerate, their paths in the xt plane are straight lines. So they move along lines like this. Between x is greater than minus one and x is less than one, our fluid picks up speed 
so the lines become flatter progressively, like this, until we reach x is greater than 1, and they all move with a slope of a quarter second per meter. What this means is that at a time like t equals 2, our velocity profile has evolved into a shape that is both spread out and moved forward in the x direction. As time increases, our profile will spread out indefinitely while moving further and further to the right. So we might now have an understanding of how this equation evolves profiles in time, but how can we translate this general idea into rigorous mathematical language? To accomplish this task, we realize that delta v equals zero along our characteristic lines. This means that v of xt equals v of x naught comma zero for all x comma t on our line. We can rename the set of our points x naught comma zero to another variable z so that v of x comma t equals v of z and v of z is just our initial velocity profile. Now our profile function in terms of z can be written like this and since it's piecewise in its composition we'll solve our equation piecewise as well. Now all we have to do is find equations for our characteristic lines and work backward to a solution. Since our fluid boxes do not accelerate we can write their positions as a function of time in a linear form. x equals v naught t plus x naught. v naught is simply v of z, and similarly x naught is just z. Therefore, our characteristic lines take the form x equals v of z times t plus z. For z is less than minus 1, v of z equals 2. So our characteristic lines are given by this. Solving for z yields the equation z equals x minus 2t. So for x minus 2t is less than minus 1, v of x comma t equals v of z equals 2. In a similar fashion, we can solve the case where z is greater than 1 to yield the solution that for x minus 4t is greater than 1, v of x comma t equals 4. The interesting case comes from the in-between. Minus 1 is less than z is less than 1. We know v of x t equals v of z, and that our characteristics are x equals v of z times t plus z. So for minus 1 is less than z is less than 1, v of z equals z plus 3. Plugging this into our characteristic equation, x equals z plus 2 times t plus z. Algebra solving for z blah blah blah, we get z is equal to x minus 3t divided by t plus 1. Since v of z equals z plus 3, in this domain, v of x comma t equals x plus 3 divided by t plus 1. This form of v of x comma t is valid in between our other two regions, or x minus 2t is greater than minus 1, and x minus 4t is less than 1. And that's it. We have a full piecewise solution to our Burgers equation with initial conditions. Written in whole, it looks like this. However, even if you were just left staring at a functionally blank screen for the past minute, the important thing to know is that all we did was take the idea of a fluid that doesn't accelerate and therefore its elements move in straight line paths and translate it into a more rigorous statement. With that in mind, just because you, as a viewer, may lack the mathematical grammar or vocabulary to fluently convert between English and strict mathematical statements does not mean that you don't understand the key insights of the problem. On the contrary, if you feel like you can understand and possibly visualize the way in which a tiny piece of water might flow and catch up to its neighbor as time moves forward, but you feel lost in the jumbled mess of symbols and abstractions, then I would argue that you, the viewer, actually has understood the problem better than a mathematician who simply repeats the algorithm we use to find our solution. This example of the importance of understanding as opposed to precisely communicating points to a larger theme in mathematics that you might broadly call mathematical intuition. That is, that feeling you get where you know you understand what you're doing and you know what you're doing is right but you haven't quite figured out the details. For example, your mathematical intuition might tell you that 46 times 53 is around 2500, despite not immediately knowing the correct answer. That intuition is what I wanted to build upon while looking at these equations, 
a feeling that you understand not just what the equation reads, but what the equation is saying. However, the Berger's equation hides one more amazing secret. And to see it, let's go back to our example with an initial profile. The velocity profile we studied looks like this. That is, a fluid whose velocity steadily increases along our x-axis, and as time progresses, we see that profile spread out as we expected. But what would happen if we had an opposite profile? One where the fluid's velocity actually decreases along our axis, like this. Well, we can solve it the same way we solved our first equation, by breaking it into pieces and solving those pieces individually. If we do this, we find that the domains where v equals 4 and v equals 2 are exactly conjugate to our first example, but our solution to the decreasing velocity profile is a little bit different this time. If we go through the same algorithm as we just did, we arrive at the solution in our relevant domain, that is v of xt equals 3 minus x divided by 1 minus t. Now, this equation looks fine and dandy for most x's and t's, but we can see upon inspection that something weird happens as t gets closer and closer to 1. For example, if t equals 0.5, we divide by 1 half. If t equals 0.75, we divide by 1 quarter. And generally, as t approaches 1, we get closer and closer to dividing by 0. This is bad. Our solution predicts that at t equals 1, weird stuff happens, and we don't know what. So to avoid this problem in our equations, let's try to understand what's going on physically. Looking back at our velocity profile, we might remember that we can track the evolution of our solution by looking at its characteristic lines, whose slopes are the initial velocities and along which the velocity does not change. That means if we start in our xt plane, we can draw lines representing our characteristics and along those lines, the velocity is the same. So let's do it for the second example. Our velocity profile looks like this and therefore our lines will radiate away from the x-axis like this. But if we look closely and we draw our lines precisely enough, we find that at exactly the point 3 comma 1, our characteristic lines intersect. Rigorously, this fact corresponds to the piecewise domains of our solutions intersecting. And since we have different velocities in different domains, when they intersect, our solution fails. To really illustrate this point, Let's draw out some velocity profiles as time approaches 1. We see that the profile slims down, and eventually looks more and more like a step function as t gets closer and closer to 1, where on the left side v equals 4, and on the right side v equals 2. This is it! This is our shock wave, a discontinuity in velocities at t equals 1 and x equals 3. If we plug these values into our intermediate domain function, v of x t equals 3 minus x divided by 1 minus t, we get 3 minus 3 divided by 1 minus 1 equals 0 divided by 0, which is indeterminate. This explains what really happens at t equals 1. We don't know exactly the velocity because 0 divided by 0 can be anything. Again, ignoring the raging math majors watching. And here it is. A smooth looking, simple equation spits out a discontinuity just like that. Now, in a physical situation, this discontinuity doesn't exactly happen, due to our model breaking down. We assume that the units of our fluid did not accelerate. However, near this discontinuity, we have to consider other forces. In the case of a fluid, it is common to consider a term that looks like c times partial squared v partial x squared, which is a viscous term that prevents these solutions from completely hitting our discontinuity, though it may get arbitrarily close to 1 if we let our constant c tend to zero. However, the idea of the discontinuity is still very useful because we can define an idea of a breaking time. That is, how long would it take for a discontinuity to form neglecting other forces? In our previous example, breaking time t star equals one because at t equals one, a discontinuity forms. Because a discontinuity indicates that our solution breaks down, breaking time tells us not only when some type of discontinuity starts to form, but also how long our assumption of zero forces and our naive model gives us good predictions. Therefore, the breaking time, t star, is the distinguishing number associated with every velocity profile whose evolution is given by Berger's equation. So how can we find t star? 
How can we calculate how long until we get our shock wave? Well, let's look back at our XT plane and our drawing of characteristic lines. We saw that our breaking time was the earliest time that our characteristics intersected. So if we can figure out when those lines intersect the earliest, we'll have the breaking time. Let's assume that we have some random initial profile that varies smoothly. It might look something like this. We remember that higher initial velocities radiate away faster by giving us less steep lines in the XT plane. Therefore, if there is a lower initial velocity on the left of a point than on the right of a point, we see that these lines will never intersect for positive times because the velocity on the right outruns the velocity on the left. Similarly, if there is a decreasing gradient in the velocity profile, then points on the left will eventually catch up to points on the right. So we immediately see that for a breaking time to exist, the velocity profile must have some point where it is decreasing. Otherwise, the whole profile would just outrun itself. Okay, so beyond that observation, how can we find exactly the earliest intersection of our characteristics? To begin, we'll make an observation about how the earliest intersection appears. That is, what is the relationship between the two points that give us the earliest intersection of characteristics? Well, imagine a decreasing profile so that we know for sure that some breaking time exists. It might look like this. If we look at two points and draw out their lines until they intersect, we might notice something strange. If we choose another two points, whose average velocity slope is greater, the lines intersect earlier. We can do some algebra to formalize this. Choose two points that have a separation of delta x and two different slopes in the xt plane, one over v1 and one over v2. Since v1 is greater than v2, one over v1 is greater than one over v2, and therefore the lines intersect. Now, imagine again riding along at a velocity v2 so that point x2 appears stationary. Then point x1 is now moving with velocity v1 minus v2 and travels the distance delta x in a time equal to distance divided by speed equals delta x divided by v1 minus v2. This is the time for two points characteristic lines separated by delta x to intersect each other. But this expression is just 1 over minus delta v over delta x or the reciprocal of average change in velocity between two points. We want to minimize this number to find t star, so we just have to find two points whose average change in velocity is greatest so that one over that number is minimized. Now, it is a mathematical fact about average changes or slopes that you can always find a slope greater than or equal to the slope between two points. Hello mean value theorem. So if we choose two points, and we want to maximize the slope between them, we have to squeeze them as close together as we can until their intersecting line appears straight. But this is just a limit. So to minimize the one divided by minus delta v over delta x, we just have to look at the delta x's that are vanishingly small. But what is delta v over delta x as x approaches zero? Well, it's dv dx, meaning that our minimum time of intersection t star is equal to min minus 1 over dv dx. We did it. We found t star. Intuitively, this function, min minus 1 over dv dx for dv dx is less than 0, just means find the point on our velocity profile with the largest negative slope, take its reciprocal, and that's the breaking time. It even has units of time, which is always a good sanity check. t star, then, simply says that if you have a velocity profile that's very steep, things catch up to each other quicker than if they weren't very steep, and that t star appears because of the steepest point in this profile. So that's it. Our mathematical look into nonlinear partial differential equations and a method or two of analysis wrapped up in there as well. With that being said, let's take a look at where you might apply the model of the inviscid Burgers equation and the idea of a breaking time. The most obvious case is in the example of water waves on a beach. The speed of the service elements is proportional to the square root of the depth of the wave. So the higher up the surface, the faster it moves. While this model does not exactly predict the inviscid Burgers equation, we still see shock waves form because the top of the wave travels faster and catches up to the bottom, leading to the wave breaking. Furthermore, breaking time t star 
is roughly proportional to min minus 1 over dy dx, a spatial slope, in the instance of water waves. So waves with a steeper negative spatial profile end up breaking sooner. With a graph of t star and min minus 1 over dy dx corresponding to a straight-ish line. On the other hand, my favorite example of the inviscid Burgers equation comes from traffic. If you've ever been on I-65 just south of Birmingham, or any busy interstate, then you've probably encountered some type of traffic jam. However, the end of the traffic jam may seem to have no cause whatsoever. That is, you're stuck in traffic for an hour, but you come out the other side not seeing a single wreck or lane blockage. We can explain this phenomenon with Burgers equation. Imagine you're in a car on cruise control. You move forward, but don't accelerate. Likewise, if all the other cars are maintaining their speeds, then individually, each element of traffic does not accelerate. But this is exactly what the inviscid Burgers equation describes. Any fluid-like medium whose individual parts don't speed up or slow down. So traffic under normal conditions can be modeled with Burgers equation. But what then happens if we have a decreasing speed profile? Well, we get a shock wave, a heap of cars all piled up on top of each other. Here, the model breaks down because cars have to accelerate and decelerate all the time in traffic. But Berger's equation can fairly accurately describe that initial shock of traffic jam formation, even if there are no major roadblocks. It's all just T star and chain rule. Finally, for all those Top Gun fans out there, Supersonic booms, like those you might encounter if you're Tom Cruise traveling well above the sound barrier, actually reproduce Berger's equation as well. This comes from the fact that in the supersonic regime, our 1D Navier-Stokes equation, minus 1 over rho partial p partial x equals v partial v partial x plus partial v partial t, actually effectively drops the pressure term because it becomes negligible at those speeds yielding, again, the inviscid Burgers equation. So, as you hopefully can see, Burgers equation hides a lot of untold depth and utility in a fairly innocuous looking equation, and I hope this video serves as a good introduction to thinking about equations, how to analyze them, and how they might apply to real world situations. This video ended up going much, much longer than I initially anticipated, but if you made it to the end, thanks for staying, and I hope you enjoyed the ride. Looking for some math stuff, Burgers equation. I want some math stuff, Burgers tonight. I want some math stuff, Burgers equation. Gotta have some math stuff, gotta have some PDA.